سمار سرح سقرم سمجدين طغم عفاش سرح كبرتي ناتنات نابغ السمنة سمعيرة تيمين سنبي كبير عبير نايبين نتمر running, least publicized war in the world today is being waged in the Horn of Africa, where three million Eritreans have been fighting since 1961 to establish their independence from Ethiopia, which has a population of close to 45 million. Since the overthrow of Emperor Haile Selassie in 1974 and the takeover by a Marxist military regime, guerrillas of the Eritrean People's Liberation Front, the EPLF, have been fighting incessantly with virtually no outside assistance. Their weapons are basically what they can capture from the Soviet-supplied Ethiopian army, the largest army in the continent of Africa. And their weapons consist mostly of the ubiquitous Soviet AK-47 assault rifle and what tanks, cannons, and mortars they can capture. Despite the massive imbalance in weapons and equipment, and despite a war in the northern mountains that has been going on longer than most Eritreans have been alive, the EPLF have a far better morale than the Ethiopians and have been steadily winning on the battlefield, mainly by ambush, surprise, and ferocious courage. don't call themselves soldiers, they call themselves fighters, which implies a temporary condition. And everyone is a fighter. And it's the only army which has women in the front lines. Some 33% of all fighters are women, who share every danger the men do, and have full equality. In fact, some combat officers are women. Women say that after the war they'll never go back to their traditional subservient role but will participate fully in the future of their country. And Eritrean men agree. All the publicity in recent years has been about the famine and hardships in Ethiopia. For their part, the Eritreans are often described as rebels or bandits. This is unfair. Eritrea historically was never part of Ethiopia. It was a colony of Italy which was taken over by the British in World War II. After the war, the West and the UN gave Ethiopia the responsibility of administering Eritrea, while supposedly recognizing its autonomy. Ethiopia instead annexed Eritrea, rather as South Africa took over Namibia. Ever since, the Eritreans have been fighting for their independence. Until recently, the main battle line ran near the town of Nakfa in the northern mountains of Eritrea. Nakfa is now a totally demolished ghost town. A scarred minaret is the only building that remains standing. Every other building is rubble. The 
Eritreans have pushed the Ethiopian army back, and already the area is being farmed and planted to grow much needed food. The trenches in the mountains near Nakfa bear mute testimony to past battles. Bleach skulls and skeletons and rusting and rotting equipment dot the landscape and the old trench systems. While the EPLF can capture weapons, it can't easily get food and supplies for the civilian population and for the nomads who have inhabited the countryside since pre-biblical times. International relief agencies and Western governments tend to boycott Eritrea, partly for political reasons, they don't want to offend Ethiopia, and partly because Eritrea is hard to get into. Roads have been hacked out of mountainsides and along stream beds and across deserts. Supplies come in by truck from Sudan, and the Eritrean Relief Association, ERA, has done a miraculous job of getting aid from abroad and distributing it within Eritrea. They get about half what they think is the minimum they need to feed and clothe the people. They're helped a lot by countries like Norway, where once a year school kids spend a day collecting aid and funds for Eritrea. Of the big agencies, Oxfam has been one of the most valued relief programs for Eritreans. Eritreans are committed to self-help and self-reliance. And Oxfam has scoured Eritrea searching for water and drilling wells. Water means life. Even the desert turns green when there's water. Oxfam has had encouraging success drilling for wells. Over the years, the Eritreans have put everything underground to escape constant bombing raids by the Ethiopians. Arota, the so-called capital of free Eritrea, looks like a series of mountain passes and gullies by day. Yet tunneled into the mountains and camouflaged under shale rocks is a thriving community, including a thousand-bed underground hospital spread over three kilometers, where every type of operation is performed, with the exception of organ transplants. The Eritreans even make their own drugs and medicines, penicillin, antibiotics, intravenous solutions, some 35 different drugs, all conforming to international standards. They train their own doctors, called barefoot doctors, who go into the attack with their male and female fighters. The valleys are studded with schools under ever-present thorn trees or in caves or stone huts. Eritrea has always been one of the more literate countries of the region. The schools all teach English. As one teacher put it, education is our hope for the future and English is our passport to the world. There is remarkable equality. The officers or leaders live like the people. There are no ranks, no uniforms, no badges and no discrimination. Even Ethiopian prisoners of war are given surprising freedom. Most don't want to go back to Ethiopia. They say they'll be shot for being captured. There are now some 20,000 Ethiopian prisoners of war whom even the International Red Cross refused to visit or help, putting further strain on Eritrea's resources. Yet the prisoners are fed and treated humanely. In one gully, there's an orphanage. Some 700 kids under 10 live in tents and stone huts with air raid trenches and shelters at hand for the Antona bombers that bomb and strafe. Run by air, the kids get a weekly bath that is something like a North American car wash. They have their heads shaved and scurry off to get freshly laundered clothes, turning in their old clothes for washing. So the kids own very little, not even the clothes on their back. Someone else gets today's clothes after they've been washed. And yet, all the kids seem well-fed and cheerful. And it's a tribute to ERA, which is one of the world's most efficient relief services, with 95% of its funds spent directly on the needy. In Eritrea, the nomads go their own way. ERA helps them, setting up schools for the nomad kids and the women who want to learn to read. been 
so much publicity about Ethiopia and whether aid is wasted and whether one of the world's most repressive regimes should be helped that often Eritrea gets overlooked. I happened to be with the Eritrean fighters after they wiped out three Ethiopian divisions and a mechanized brigade in an ambush and I went into the captured Ethiopian army headquarters and found all sorts of evidence of Canadian wheat, West German and American vegetable oil, and Red Cross cooking oil and the like, being used to feed Ethiopian soldiers, or on sale in the black market, despite labels proclaiming that this food was a gift to the hungry and not to be sold. Abuse of aid doesn't happen in Eritrea. Behind the advancing fighters, Ira comes up with trucks of food and camel caravans to feed and supply the nomads. No one knows how the war will eventually end, but the more one learns and sees, the more one is forced to conclude that the Eritreans, fighting since 1961, are unlikely ever to surrender. With recent victories in the field and more territory and civilians and prisoners to look after, the Eritreans are increasingly hard pressed for resources. And Ethiopian reprisals and punishments make survival difficult, especially when the Ethiopians deny international relief workers access to the guerrilla area. life goes on. Children are being fed, are being educated, are being rescued. There's no thought of surrender or quitting. If only the outside world knew more about the realities of Eritrea, they might get more help from non-governmental sources like churches, private agencies, and service clubs. A little goes a very long way among a people who have nothing except their courage, their dreams, and their self-reliance. Thank you. 